Um, as we as we kind of do a bit of a bit of a shuffle, I'd love to invite my panelists onto onto the stage um, and to introduce them. Johnny Freeland, who you've met, uh, Nathiata Awaiohua Naituho, um, Councillor Josephine Bartley. So we talked a little bit about decision making, Josephine. I, I wonder whether some of those questions will will head your direction. So Josephine is Councillor for Manukia Kia Tamaki Ward, my ward, which is which is great to have her here tonight. Uh, Corbin Fanga, um, who is an executive board member of Order Tayo, uh, New Zealand's Climate and Health Council, um, and Faisia Archi, um, a Pacific climate warrior and, and, and activist and all around everywhere doing wonderful things. Um, we also had Jill Kwan, you may have seen, who is a Rangatahi advisory panel member for the Aotearoa Circle, who unfortunately couldn't make it this evening. Um, she's not feeling well, but I see already Jill, well done. She's online. She's already submitted a question, which is fantastic, which is just a reminder for you all to get your questions in um, onto, onto, onto Slido. You can upvote other people's questions, which I would encourage you to do. Um, so with that, what I'm going to do is just uh, navigate elegantly down to the, to the floor. Um, and as I do, there's a question that I wanted to pose to each of the participants. And David, I'm going to skip over you because you've had the mic for a little bit. And I'm going to go, <laughs> go to fight Asia and then along the, along the panel um, to um, share a few words about yourself, your mahi, where, where you see the world. But the question I'd love you to address is that um, you know, on a scale of zero to ten, zero being pretty poor, ten being fantastic, how would you rate our local climate response uh, in its in its in how well it takes into consideration principles of an equitable or just transition, um, and and why? So, what's your score? What's your rating for us, and and why do you give it that rating? All right, thank you. Um, Tala for lava. My name is Fire Isia Archi. Um, <laughs> I am a third year student studying a Bachelor of Arts in Global Studies at the University of Auckland. I major in Environments and Sustainable Development and Sociology. Um, I am a member of Pacific Climate Warriors, Pacific Mission Aotearoa, and I'm also on the board of Auckland Climate Festival. Um, I would say it's definitely not a 10, mm -hmm. definitely not a 9, definitely not 8, a 5. Um, I think we've had a lot of conversations um, on climate change, but we have less actions. Um, and yeah, a lot of conversations about it, le less actions. I think it's about time we put actions, our words into actions, if that makes sense. So yeah. Ere ana ngā tai o mihi ki a koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. A ko Corbin whanga katipato ku ingoa he uri a hau a nō wai kato nō Ngāti Mani e Poto hoki. Uh, so, kia ora koutou, uh, Corbin's my name. I'm from Waikato. I grew up in the small town in Aroa Wahia. Uh, and I come from a background in public health. I've had the privilege, the opportunity uh, to work in the space of, of community health, haora Māori, population health. Uh, and I think as, as part of that and in relation to our kōrero today around equitable transitions. I've also had the privilege to be involved in you know, interfacing the space of, of hawara, of, of climate and of environment, and actually trying to put that into practice and into some applications uh, within my roles in the public service. So uh, hopefully as part of our quarter or today, I can, I can contribute and provide some insights around that. Um, but yeah, in response to that, that part, I, Alec, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and be a little bit boring and cut right down the middle and say five out of 10. <laughs> <laughs> two fives so far, right? Two fives. Two fives make a ten. But I, I'd say um, uh, a similar to Fiasia, um, you know, we haven't been able to see the transmission of these plans. For example, the uh, emissions reductions plan, which is obviously still in, in, in SQ. And um, uh, I'd like to see these not only communicated at those higher levels of, of policy, of, of policy and decision making, um, but actually, how do we communicate you know, not, not, not only the outcomes that we want to achieve, not only the goals and the standards, but how do we, how do we communicate the importance and the intention of these processes to, to everyone in, in, in He Tato Katoa? Um, and I think, you know, I actually see part of, part of my mahi uh, in looking at health. Uh, and how health is going to be impacted by climate change, but not necessarily just the consequences for health of climate change and a climate crisis, but also the opportunities that a, a just transition presents. Uh, and through my mahi, uh, you know, I've been able to actually explore a little bit of that 
uh, and 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 the, you know that's happening across the sector, across the private sector as well. So yeah, um, five out of ten. Five. Kia ora. Kia ora. Josephine. Uh, tēnā ko Josephine Bartley aho, uh, no Hamua aho, uh, he uh, kai mahi aho, uh, no te Kauni Hira, uh, Tamaki Makoto. Kei te hare, te ngākau, ki te kite i ākoutou i tēnei wā, nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, Tā lofa lava, I'm Josephine Batley, I'm an Auckland councillor. I was elected from the Mongakiki Tamaki Ward. I've been a councillor now for five, five, five years, feels like 50 years. Um, and before that I was on the Mongakiki Tamaki Local Board. Uh, since 2010. Before that, I was working for Consumer Affairs for 14 years. So my background is in law and really uh, about fairness and um, social injustice, I think, is pretty much what my life is about. Um, I acknowledge Alec for the invitation to be part of this panel. I don't ever get to be on a panel about climate action or climate change because it's not um yeah it's not my wheelhouse i guess but uh it's about community so it is my wheelhouse wheelhouse i acknowledge auckland conversations ashley and your team uh, for putting this together and working with um, alec our councillor here angela dalton who's the deputy chair of the planning environment and parks committee at auckland council and her strong leadership and also apologies from the chair, uh, Richard Hills, who was another strong fighter um, for climate action and the environment. Oh, the question, um, I'm a five as well. Um, I think, uh, you know, we, in 2019, 11 June 2019, we declared a climate emergency at Auckland Council. Uh, and we have the Te Taruki uh, Tafari uh, climate action plan. We have the targeted rate um, that's brought in quite a lot of money, billion dollars, and most of it has gone into electrifying our bus fleet and getting bus services to some communities who don't have access. And Urban Ngahiri is in there, along with our 21 community recycling centres, and I'm very proud of the recycling centre in Onia because that's the first one led by Māori and Pacifica communities and the shoreline adaptation plan. So we've, we've come some way, but not fast enough. So that's why I give it a five. But in terms of locally, acknowledging what all of us are doing locally, we were doing stuff to do with the environment on our local board when I joined in 2010, but it wasn't classed as climate action, but it actually is. So yeah, I'll go with five. Thank you. Uh, kia ora tātou. Um, I'll, I'll say something that, something, uh, just introducing myself, I've got to say something different than the introduction. So, um, I, I was involved through our Mana Whenua Forum of Tamaki Makoto, where 19 Mana Whenua sit together in co partnering with Auckland Council in developing Te Taruki Atafiri. And at that point, and, and I guess the irony is the, um, the Te Taruki Atafiri was adopted when Auckland had a different water crisis. We we're in the middle of a drought. Um, so it's ironic that two, a few years later we're now sitting in the context we've had too much water this year. Um, and so that work, and often I think where we landed in the trajectory and, and a lot of the work that has been done since six, we were tracking towards a six. Um, both in a local government and I think in a central government perspective, but in the last 18 months we've slipped back to maybe a four and a half, five. And, and a lot of that is to do with a shift in political views um, and, and sort of being distracted by other things as opposed to what's, what's facing our communities and, and, and the state of our environment and our people. So, so we had a real hopeful six, we we're tracking towards six, and, and especially a lot of the actions and things that have come out of it. it it's now sort of, in our view, dropped in the pecking order, 
with other things and certainly the challenges that many of our councillors have to face when they're supporting and advocating for our communities. Um, and it's really apt that we're having this conversation in South Auckland um, because um, the other point from a mana whenua perspective, whether it's climate change, poverty, inequity, um, water crises, flooding, um, it all, it's all about well-being or oranga at the end of the day. Um, and so, so the opportunity really to um, come together around the well-being of our people, our communities, our environment. Um, and, and I love that whakaro that um, was shared earlier about um, it's the care in the careful revolution. And, and, and you know, and, and another sort of thing that's just popped up yesterday is when you get um, politicians making statements like Māori are not Indigenous. You know, so, so things that were given around climate change are now being questioned now. And that's the problem. We, we, we circle back and question everything that should be given now. Um, and that becomes the uncareful revolution when we're not really caring. We're getting caught up in a lot of the political stuff and hype. And especially now we're heading into another election cycle. Um, and that's part of why the Climate Festival was sort of located at this period, because it's an opportunity for Aucklanders to come together, have these sort of conversations. Um, and, and it is about that climate action from, from a community-anchored, community-led perspective. So kia ora. Kia ora koutou. So, uh, hey, pretty, I, I actually think you're all being really somewhat generous, like <laughs> fives and uh, four and a half. I, um, I think um, uh, where we are is, is quite interesting. There's, there's a question in the group which I'll, I'll kind of throw out there, um, which kind of builds on, David, your conversation. And actually, one of the things we wanted to cover was, was um, in terms of progress, in terms of what are we seeing that's good, what are we seeing in terms of positive action. Obviously, very recently, we had MB and Motu do their Just Transition Guide for Communities. And I want you guys to hold that community view. The reason um, we wanted to pull this panel was that diversity of viewpoints. So communities are not one thing. They're very diverse. And so I guess a question to you, David, when we're thinking about careful, what, what, is, what is good and how do we bridge that multiple different voices into, into the conversation to, to recognise that often we don't have the... Uh, or we don't have that voice, how do we bring that voice out? So things that have happened that you think are really positive that, that, that bring that careful transition, uh, careful revolution, and also the, the, the multiple voices that we have. Yeah, I think um, one of the key things is just, is just listening and just hearing the sorts of challenges that communities are facing um, in regards to the transition, because it's very hard for Policymakers, whether they're, um, you know, up the Auckland Council Tower building, or or whether they're in Wellington setting policy, to actually truly understand where the pressure points are and where the sticking points are for people um, in regards to climate change policy. Um, so, and and a lot of the the means by which to to change people's behaviour and to drive climate action forward, um, you know. They're, they're often price mechanisms, they're, they're sort of abstract rules and regulations. It, it's, there's not necessarily that process of understanding how people are responding, how they're feeling about this, and often when the backlash builds, it, it, it's too late to, to stop that momentum. Um, hearing people's concerns and geez, even just acknowledging them is a really important step because if there's a shared understanding um, that you know, those concerns have been heard and understood and listened to, um, then that, even that can go some way to diffuse some of these tensions. But the next step, obviously, is to reconsider how policy is being done, how it's being pursued, and to, um, you know, adapt our processes accordingly. And, yeah, what, what we talked about in this recent um, guide to community just transitions um, that was commissioned by MB was really to take that community lens and to give communities the tools to articulate for themselves what their aspirations were, where they see the sticking points and where they might see some of the solutions because members of the community also 
are sometimes the holders of the, the expertise, the local knowledge, which actually helps to, to unlock some of these challenges. And so it's, um, you know, some of the problems, I think, in the way that climate policy has been done here is that it's tended to be taken in a very top-down approach. And I think there's an opportunity to think um, more from the bottom up. Both are, both are needed because communities don't necessarily have the resources that they need to, to realise their aspirations. So they need that connectivity with, with the big levers of government and, and capital markets and so on. But we need to get that bottom up and top down working together. Can, can I bring uh, Josephine uh, Faasia? I'd love to get your your perspective. So Faasia, from the from the community, because a lot of the work that you're doing is with the community and trying to galvanise and talk through what is it, you know, how do we get our voice? So I'd love to get your perspective on, on how that works or doesn't work in terms of getting that voice. What does the community that you're talking to need? And then and then Josephine as well, if you can think about, uh, you know, how how do you bring that to that council table? Like and and how do you um, help shape that um, understanding from a, a, a broad range around that table to try and get that get that view. But yeah, I see you. Right. Um, I just want to acknowledge um, our Pacifica community tonight. Um, a lot of the work that we do in the climate space is through um, our indigenous ways of storytelling, um, um, et cetera, et cetera. And I feel like with um, how we bring this into the table is um, there's there's a lot of inequality happening. And I hate that ever since I started university, all my essays has been inequality, inequality. I've tried my very best to be positive, but it's everywhere I go, it's everywhere is inequality. And yeah, that, co that also comes to like, every time I try to bring up a conversation um, about climate change in our community, they have a lack of understanding about climate change is because what's happening in our community they're trying to survive and they all have um we're all put into this um category where like we're all working a lot in labor jobs and um every time we try to bring in conversations about climate change we're like okay just go to school go be a doctor don't bring this conversation about us we don't believe in climate change so i feel like with inequality happening um, in this society, there's a lot of, um, yeah, as Pacifica, we're really trying our very best to, like, um, to tackle this issue, yeah. Yeah, uh, absolutely back up um, <laughs> what Fasia was saying. Uh, your question, Alec, about how you bring Bring the voice of the community to the table. How do you bring the voice of the community to the table? Um, I think it really, uh, yeah, you you really, you can't go past the issues that are out there in the community and you'd be blind not to notice the inequality that's out there. You bring it to the table, but ideally, what is it? It's It's... It's what what people find will get them votes to come back to that table, to be honest. <laughs> That's the reality. Uh, it, I mean, around the Auckland Council table, people are worried about how they will get back in. So they will support things that are uh, popular, uh, but may not be the things that we need to be facing as a city. And, yeah. So that's that's a bit bleak, right? <laughs> yeah, that's bleak. Because <laughs> um, because I guess going back and 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 maybe Johnny, I can bring you in as well. Because this this view and and we saw this in Tataki Tafri about um, those those processes that we've historically had, and this is your top down, bottom up, right? That we have policy setting at the high level that that has assumptions about how people want to engage, and then you've got Fasia, your contribution about actually what's happening on the ground, and Josephine, what you've seen. And this is what we heard, Johnny Hay, particularly from that, um, those communities, Māori, Pacifica, with some fantastic knowledge and insights, but actually getting heard is really challenging. And, and, and how, do we, how do we actually build those principles of equity, which requires us to think about different perspectives as key? So. Yeah, I think one of the key challenges is that our current, what I call our current square systems aren't fit for purpose today, post-COVID, 21st century, and, and it's almost like, uh, you know, about maintaining power control. Um, 
and and so within that work, um, and certainly within a Pacifica and Te Ao Māori perspective, is we're very values anchored, and those sort of core values haven't changed over generations. So we navigate by a set of givens, but often in a square Western system, those things are always up for grabs, and that's a confusing that creates confusion for many of our communities. Um, and I think the other um, challenge of driving from a bottom-up perspective because it is really about those connections across our communities. One of the key principles that the Mana Whenua Forum adopted was the whanangatanga, the relationships, our whakapapa relationships with our Pacifica whanau across the Pacific because that's part of our whakapapa too. And, and one of our concerns from a policy perspective, it's, if it's that continuation of the current square top-down approach, and we're hearing that label that um, around climate refugees, uh, and, and with the concerns of our whānau and Tuvalu and Tokelo and, and Kiribati around sea rise. So, so people are preparing for this influx of climate refugees, whereas from our perspective, there are whānau from one part of our whakapapa that are going to come to stay in another part of the whakapapa. And, and this will represent the third key migrational shift of whakapapa over the last thousand years. So a thousand years ago, my ancestors got on voyaging canoes, came to Aotearoa. We arrived as Pacifica people and became Māori to this place, to this. Then post-World War II, we saw another shift. Many of our whānau from the Pacific came to New Zealand for work and other opportunities, and we see those, those um, migration patterns within Aotearoa. A lot of our Cook Island whānau that ended up in the forestry in Tokoroa and, the, and, and other places across New Zealand. So, so what, what this climate shift represents is like a third wave of movement from the Pacific to Aotearoa. But if we rely on the current um, policy settings and thinking, it'll be, become like an immigration issue, not um, the opportunity to welcome whānau to another part of their whakapapa and the opportunity is our Pacifica whānau that are living here together with mana whenua, how do we prepare ourselves for that welcoming, for that uh, ability because uh, many of our refugee people have suffered in terms of coming into this place. Um, places like Waipareira are a Māori response to urban migration. You know, trying to make sense of these things and, and, and bringing the care into the careful revolution. You know, so there's a lot of existing practices and models that we can actually be drawing from and learning when we think about um, Aotearoa being a convergence of place in, in terms of um, part of those transition. And within Te Tarukia Tafiri, one of the, we talked about two little shifts and three big shifts. Um, the two little shifts was recalibrating BAU, business as usual, around water, climate, well-being. You know, just focus on what are the fundamental goals. And then the second small shift was really about preparing for transition. How do we prepare our communities for a shift so that they're part of the shift, not the shift happening to them? And the reality of many of our whanaus not even aware of things like climate change because of being in survival mode. Uh, in my day job, I work for Oranga Tamariki, and so I face this on a daily basis of trying to keep our Tamariki safe, dealing with family harm, pee, all those sort of things, and then we want to talk about a just transition, when they just got to try and transition their lives in, from that survival mode. So, yeah, I think, I think that, that's a real opportunity around um, the shift that needs to occur in the system in order for us to then think about that, that careful transition, careful revolution. So kia ora. Can I, can I just, um, before I, I want to come on to the health and wellbeing and bring you in, Corbin, before I do that, um, Councillor Bartley, I mean, one mm -hmm. of the things that I think um, uh, some, of the, some of the audience may remember in both the COVID experience and the Auckland Anniversary Day flooding, 
you know, being out in the streets, and I remember seeing clips of yourself and other councillors, uh, Councillor Dalton and Hills and, and others, being out there with the community through these big events. And I suppose there's one which is a very proactive, like how do we make sure that the interventions that we put in place, and there's some comments here about move to electrification, but what does that mean for, for, for folk who can't afford electric vehicles and so on? But then there's the, the, the crisis response side of things. So when you were out there and you were helping these communities through this reality of climate change playing out like what what were you hearing what was top of mind from those communities and how do we how do we make sure that that is um uh it sounds terrible but not not lost how do we make sure that the responses that we build kind of recognizes the role of the community in that yeah i think um what the vaccination you know how our whole city went into lockdown the floods, I think what that showed was when community are leading the response, it's way better than anything that an agency or centralised um, organisation can do because they don't have those connections and it's not from the community. That's the only way to get mobilisation is when it's from the community. Uh, the other, um, I suppose, uh, issue that came out of it was what do people value? Do they value the collective or the individual? And at Auckland Council, we weren't really involved in the vaccination rollout. It wasn't until a few of us councillors kept banging the table really and saying, you've got councillors here that are celebrating that their area has got a high vaccination rate. whoop de doo we're fine, we don't have to worry about anything. But that's not how we operate. We don't operate in isolation based on map boundaries. People, you know, move throughout the city. So it was about if, we, if we're going to get through this lockdown as a city, we're going to have to look at the ones that are falling behind and everybody has to get in behind and get them, you know, get them to that level so that we can all move ahead as a city. So it was a real change, and then council, you know, got involved, got behind the, the roller, and supported the specific targeting, which was our Māori and Pacifica communities. And that's the same communities that are identified to be the worst affected because they have fewer resources in climate um, emergencies. So how do you prepare? Pre pre preparation isn't going to be about uh, making sure they all have food parcels, because food was the biggest issue for a lot of people, it was food. Um, but it's not about preparing a food pack and water bottles for three days. It's got to go even bigger than that. Uh, so, you know, um, do they have the infrastructure in our low-income communities to be able to handle when the rain comes? I grew up in Mangere, it's never flooded. But these recent floods, it flooded. Never seen that in Mangere before. So, you know, even at that level, how are we preparing our communities uh, to be, what is the word? I heard flood re resilience. Now I've been reading a lot of stuff from Dr. Tuila Percival that it's children that are the worst affected. The majority that have died in a lot of the climate um, action has been children or worst affected has been children and how are we preparing for that as a city, as a, as a country, so yeah. yeah. I, th I think there's a critical piece here that you said earlier which that reflects on where the, the mindset moving from uh, what's, what's right for me to how do we move through this, but in order to do the we, we need to understand who that we is and the breadth of perspectives and how we resonate, how that draws resonance. So um, somewhat related, but, 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 but I, I wanted to bring in that whole order that, that health and well-being lends to it. And Corbin, I'm really keen to get your insights from order tire. Obviously, we, um, we heard there's a whole bunch of other things going on in the back of our, our minds collectively that's not climate related and so on. Um, health almost is both a challenge and an opportunity, the, the challenge being the health impacts associated with changing climate. But the opportunity is here is a lens that we can talk to that hopefully will help build that we, that, that broader understanding that actually this is good. To your point earlier, you know, climate action isn't all bad. There are some real positives in terms of health benefits. So I guess from your perspective and that of um, and also if you, you, you can fold it in some way, I know that you've done a dissertation recently on health, mental health. 
right, and the impacts of mental health. So really keen to get your sense on the opportunity for, for health, that intersection of climate and health, to, to try and pull us all together in a way that understands that we need to move forward together. Absolutely, you hit it on the head. There's a, a number of opportunities we can see and we can prioritise. Um, but I just want to double back actually and respond to your, your last question around um, community voice. Um, how do we bring those voices to the table? How do we instill a bottom-up approach? Um, one thing I, I wanted to touch on is it's critically important that we, we don't demonise communities, we don't demonise identities. Uh, it's so polarised as, as it is, uh, but it has been for how, however many years. And um, David, you sort of spoke briefly on uh, the groundswell movement, and I want to—I want to—I'm going to take the slow. I want to—I want to consider, um, you know, the identity of, of rural communities. And when we look at the groundswell movement, uh, the powers at be, the powers that are influencing that movement and what it represents, I think clearly there is a concern, uh, a self-interested concern in some sense, a community concern for the, for the rural communities who are worried about their way of life, uh, who are worried about what the transition might have and might impact on them. Um, and it's, it's, it's critically important that we, we take those voices uh, and we, we see the reality of the movement for, for what it is. Um, and when we, look, when we talk about a bottom-up approach, Groundswell represents a bottom-up approach in a sense, but then also we have to look at what actors are involved in that movement that are actually manipulating their constituency. Uh, and I look to the likes of the agricultural lobby, I look to the likes of the shareholders of conglomerates from Fonterra, for example. What influence do they have in terms of manipulating the rural communities? And rural identities as well are critically important. When I think of rural identities, I don't just think of of landowning farmers, I think of share milkers, I think of farmhands, I think of you know local Māori communities, rural communities, uh, young tama you know who lives with man on the back blocks on a, on Māori land who has to walk through concrete rivers, uh, you know who has no access to these lands that are, that are rural, um, and those are the those are the communities that are represented in this groundswell movement, and I wonder how are they being manipulated? How is their genuine concern being manipulated for what is essentially a profit-seeking incentive? You know, when we when we look at the at the movement itself, when we look at the leadership itself. So you know, groundswell it's bottom up, but at the same time it's top down because there's that the governance of the sector that it represents, of the communities that it represents, agricultural lobbyists. They're actually the top down, and they're they're manipulating what is what is essentially a genuine concern from rural communities. Um, so hopefully that made some sense. But uh, <laughs> to push back and uh, to go back to your original part I, around, you know, whole water, climate, environment, uh, as I said in my introduction, I've, I've been privileged to have the opportunity to consider that in some programs in my work. Um, and, you know, the consequences of the climate crisis, we're well aware that there's an increasing severity and frequency of extreme uh, weather events, we're aware that there's a global temperature rise, we're aware of the increase in vector-borne illnesses of, of ocean acidification and all of these, uh, you know, these, these consequences of, of, climate, uh, of the climate crisis are going to have an impact on, uh, you know, the life-supporting systems uh, that humanity relies on, of course. Uh, but that's the deficit approach. You know, if, if we highlight and we focus on what, what's the impending doom then you know that's a that's a critical driver we've seen behind climate anxiety. Why are people being, you know, um, why are young people having a lot of concerns around mental health and climate anxiety? You know, we've heard cases of of, of young climate activists who are, and I myself have sort of felt this pressure, uh, you know, towards depression, suicidal ideation, fakamomori. You know, uh, I work for Tiako Faiora, I work for the Orangi Hindengaro clinical team, and that's exactly one uh, dimension of our mahi and, and the whakamomori suicide prevention space is actually, you know, what, what's the influence of climate change? What's the influence of a growing consciousness around, you know, the impending concerns for climate change? Uh, so if we can shift it to focusing on the health opportunities that a just transition presents, I think that's, that's incredibly um, uh, important. For me, I've had a, an opportunity, you know, to realise uh, my own you know, sort of empowerment, building resilience through 
uh, communion with the natural environment. You know, uh, through growing my own consciousness and awareness around, uh, you know, the uh, anthropogenic impact on our climate, on our environments. Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll speak a, 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 to us, I guess, a story and experience I've had myself, um, and that's specifically around uh, diving, actually. So, you know, going free diving. Um, and, you know, that's a, it's, a, it's an activity. Uh, and I think the first time I ever had the opportunity to go for a dive, you know, I was, I was in, a, in a relatively dark place, you know, in terms of my own mental health state. I was about, you know, 18 years old. Uh, and a mate of mine, he invited me to come for a dive with him. And I thought, oh, hang on, no, sharks. Uh, yeah, right away, I was just immediately concerned. And, um, you know, I, I, I went into the water and, uh, well, I didn't go into the water. We went to the water and we were preparing to dive. And a mate of, uh, a mate of ours, you know, he, he recited a karakia instantly. And I sort of thought, oh, hang on. You know, okay, sweet. So what's this about? Yep. So the, the bro, he did a, a karakia. Um, and they explained sort of what, what the karakia was about, uh, what the process was about. And then, uh, you know, we went for a dive and I was incredibly afraid, you know, I, I'd sort of been dealing with my own concerns and I, you know, wondering what was going to happen. Um, going into the water, immersing myself in what was, you know, one of the only really wild natural resources that we have in Aotearoa. You know, you can go for a hike in the bush, but it's, a, it's on a trail. You know, there's, there's so few places that are untouched in this country. Um, but going into the ocean, which of course also has had its own impact, uh, you know, from things like fishing and whatnot, but, uh, and being immersed in what was the most natural environment I'd ever been in, uh, communing with nature. You know, I, I think when I first got into the water, I was holding onto my mate, you know, I didn't, you know, I was, I was like, it's quite scared and sort of wondering, you know, what was going to happen. But then, um, you know, I saw a, a fai, uh, a stingray swim past, and, and immediately I thought, oh, hang on, like, oh, that's pretty cool. Well, what's, what's, what's going on, you know? And then, um, uh, you know, I sort of kept swimming in the, the coral reefs and I was able to have that sort of objective view that I hadn't had the exposure to before. My point being, communion with nature, having those opportunities to connect with our natural environment, with the taiao, there's something there, there's something within that. Um, and this is just one example of the potential opportunities that we can, we can exacerbate as we look towards the low carbon future, as we look to land use transition, uh, as we look to, you know, uh, an equitable transition. Um, there are many involved, there are many, and yeah, we can touch on that more, but I've spoken too long. So. No, 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 it's, it's <laughs> great. So, so there's a few things that I, I'd love us to pull out in there. One, one just talking about connectivity. So um, I was lucky, um, there was a panel discussion as part of the Climate Festival on climate anxiety. Um, last last week, um, and and very much that conversation of connectivity was critical. Whether it's to planet or people, or whatever, just finding connections to to help flip that. And I think it's a really important part about um, about how we how we individually respond and how we how we make sure we retain our well-being. The other thing, and and we have political economist David Hall coming out here. Um, just on your point about groundswell, there's a really interesting thing here where. Um, Groups like that, and this is just the thesis, groups are trying to create voice because they're not heard, so they congregate and they and they and so this is the how do we create systems that don't require that acknowledge individuals like the different perspectives that we have um, without having to congregate and potentially having that message um, taken away or, or, or taken off in a funny direction and all those kind of things. And I think um, there are the, 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 there is many, and, and I'd encourage people to look into like, you know, how well function is our democratic system. Um, sorry, this is going on a slight tangent, but, 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 you know, how do we use different methods, more deliberative methods? And I was talking to Anne Bardsley recently at Koi2 about the work that they're doing on uh, VKT reduction. Actually, Councillor Dalton probably knows much about this. So, so this is a really interesting point though, right? So we've been talking earlier about communities, community voice, how do we amplify that or how do communities get their voice heard without having to be lost in amalgamation, right? How do we, how do, we do that? Um, and, and so I don't, I don't know if anyone has an answer to that. I, think. I, can't, I can't be heard at the back. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, 
<laughs> that's that's good to know. Thank you. Um, so in terms of in terms of that kind of uh, how do we how do we bring that voice to, from communities? I don't know, David. Some of your reflections. I know it's a big topic. Before yeah. before I dive into some questions here, which I've been trying to feed in through through. Sure. I I mean the um, the dynamic talked about before. Um, you know, corporate support of grass and co-option of grassroots activities has a has a name. It's called astroturfing, and it was um, <laughs> you know it's been it's been done for for decades in the U.S., which has a incredibly well organised and and very well um, funded. I mean, they the oil and gas sector there spends hundreds of millions of dollars a year on um, on lobbying and so on. I mean, I don't think. Fortunately, we have the, that same level of pressure, but it's not to say that those sorts of things don't don't occur for sure. Um, how we kind of preserve the integrity and the sincerity of those concerns, because I agree. I mean, I have a rural background myself. Um, grew up in North Canterbury on a sheep farm, so you know that always checks my sense of reality on these issues. And I think you know people you know, they really do have genuine concerns about their, their livelihoods with these sorts of changes, um, you know, and you have to kind of treat them as sincere to even start a coherent conversation. Um, you know, there, there is a lot of interest in to how to redirect these energies into more fruitful ways, and a lot of people are interested in ideas of um, citizens' assemblies, um, you know, many publics, processes where... Um, a group of people which is somewhat representative of a community gets together to talk through the issues with support from experts and so on. And um, I know that um, it, through this um, community transitions process, actually I had the great fortune to meet um, Helmut Modlik of um, Ngāti Toa, and he's sort of experimenting with this down there with a, um, you know, which draws both on Talanoa traditions um, from from the Pacific, but also, um, you know, wānanga from, from Te Ao Māori and, and those sort of Western ideas of um, citizens' assemblies as well. Um, and, yeah, so there, there's experiments of this nature going on. Um, you know, the challenge, again, and it comes back to this bottom-up, top-down dynamic, is when a group like that comes to make their decisions and their recommendations... What happens then? Because if you look at the French example, um, where Emmanuel Macron, um, you know, he responded to the Gilets jaunes by saying he would set up a new process, and they set up a citizens' assembly, the um, Citizens' Convention on Climate. They went through a long process. It was incredibly well funded, and um, Macron promised to take on the recommendations without any dilution. But when <laughs> when push came to shove, you know, he actually started saying, well, I can't treat this, his actual words were, I can't treat this like the Quran, like a sacred text. And he started to drop down all of the um, recommendations until, you know, it had dwindled down to a few. And we've seen a version of this in, in Aotearoa through the Land and Water Forum where, you know, again, in the, in the rural land use environment, a number of organisations got together to go through a multi-stakeholder process to come up with recommendations, and the government chose not to go through with them. So it, it is tricky because you need those dynamics working together. The Crown often has the, um, the money and the, and the regulatory power to put these recommendations into action, and it holds that power, that economic and regulatory power, it hoards that power even <laughs> and and is very reluctant to give it give that power away but i think you know that's um to to johnny's point you know th these institutions like the crown they're just not set up well for what we're going through now they're incredibly fixed robust you know immobile inflexible institutions which struggle to to change and to turn and to tack and struggle also to share power and to, and to decentralize some of their um, capability. But I think that is part of the, the revolution and part of the transition which needs to occur because it's not just in technology, it's also going to need to be a transition in the institutions that we rely on. 
I'm keen and, 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 and hopefully we'll get there because obviously there's another system, the health system that's going through a, a, a similar kind of transition to try and be both, um, to, to Johnny's word, square and circle. You know, how do you pull these together? So um, have a think on that because I, I want to come back. But but before I do, there's a, there's a really important point here about one, there's one thing to bring people into the room to be part of the conversation. There's another to see the effects of that. So Fatasia, I know, you know you've been in lots of rooms. You've been invited into lots of places. You um, went over to um, the C40 Summit. Um, but, but from your perspective, like, how does it feel when you, you are, which is great, you're included, but, but then maybe see that actually things don't really follow through in terms of action activity? Um, I'd like to bring in um, one of the um, experiences <coughs> sorry, that um, I encountered when I was invited to um, represent Auckland at the C40 Mayor's Conference in Argentina last, last year. Oh, sorry. sorry. Um, so the C40 um, stands for cities, or C cities and 40 um, cities who are in um, the organization. It's an international organization where they... Um, they focus on cities with a population of 1.3 billion. And Auckland was nowhere near that, um, that population. But the reason why we're under C40 is because we're an innovative city. And um, during my experience in, um, in Buenos Aires, Argentina, um, no one really cared about New Zealand. Um, the bigger your country is, the bigger people will praise you. And we were literally, um, the way I look at it, we were like, um, so there's a table, people sitting on the table, and then we were on the menu. They were just like, okay, we want, okay, we don't want New Zealand, I don't want this, we don't want this, we don't want that. Um, but what I'm trying to say was that I was sent there to represent Auckland, and to represent, um, but when I arrived in um, um, Buenos Aires, Argentina, I wanted to represent me being Pacifica, because I've grown up and um, I was born and raised in Samoa, and to be in a space where there's no people like me, I was the only brown person representing Pacifica, and everyone else were from the north, and I was the only South, the global South. It's like, you know what? I'm here, I'm Pacifica, I'm gonna represent my Pacifica people. And um, they were giving me an opportunity to speak, to make a speech and talk about, you know, being a youth and what do I wanna bring on the table, yapa, yapa, yapa. Um, I ask, I request, it's like, I don't wanna speak, I want to moderate a panel and I want to talk straight to the mayors. I was given the opportunities to moderate a panel and to talk more about green jobs and um, uh, vulnerable communities. During my panel with, um, with four mayors, um, I asked them questions, so what are you doing in your cities like, what, with the vulnerable communities? They had no idea what they were talking about. Um, and it just makes me realize like, damn, how crazy these people are. And um, an example of that was um, the mayor of London. Um, <laughs> dude, <laughs> the mayor of London, uh, dude posted on Twitter, it was really nice with a photo of him and us, the youth, saying it's really, it was really great um, spending time with the youth. Dude saw us walking down the stairs, stopped us, took a photo, and then swap off. And he posted on Twitter, it was really nice to see, it was really nice to spend time with the youth. And I feel like what I've learned from my experience um, internationally was the fact that we're literally on the menu, not on the table. Um, we really want that chair sitting there and be like, okay, this is what we're going through. But it's about time that we shift that back, put us on the, t on the seat, not um, on the menu. All right, if that makes sense. Awesome. Well, not not an awesome experience, but 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 I think it's a really important part to to think about how do we shift from yes, we're talking about equitable transitions, and yes, we recognise lots of voices, but we need to move beyond the tokenistic, you know, platitudes to actually get some real real integrated action. Um, just to come back again, so the the, the challenge of um, systems that don't necessarily reflect this or, or intransigent. So Corbin, I don't know, you know, from the, we are going through this really interesting um, process with Te Whata to, um, to um, and, and, and the Māori Health Authority as well, and it's like, um, is that, I mean, is that approach working and what are the challenges of that? Is that something we need to see more generally? If we are going to, and this is not necessarily a health question, but when we think about a climate response that needs to be more equitable, that we have structures of government that are quite 
rigid. Is this a model that takes us forward? I mean, yes, yeah, certainly as a public servant, I am somewhat restricted in, in my opinion. But that said, um, I think, you know, when we look at the likes of Te Ako Whaiora as an independent statutory entity um, at arm's length from government, the impact and the outcomes that we're going to see from these changes aren't overnight. They're, they're incredibly long-term uh, focused. You know, the aspirations are of devolving care, of devolving governance and authority over health commissioning, uh, you know, there's an establishment process uh, and it's an inherently political issue. We've heard political perspectives and voices around, uh, you know, the status of Te Ako Whai Ora. Um, We've heard responses like the HMAC report, which was scathing. Uh, over the outcomes and the, the financial outcomes in particular. We're always considering dollars and cents uh, as we move forward. One particular challenge I probably can share uh, is around you know, the outcomes of, of programs. And I'll, I'll go back to how I mentioned uh, you know, the suicide prevention. An issue within suicide prevention is that it's incredibly difficult to measure the outcomes of a suicide prevention program because the outcome is death. Uh, how do you measure the success of a, of a suicide prevention program? Uh, you know, qualitative data and qualitative whānau voice, lived experience, these are all incredibly important as we attempt to quantify, you know, the benefit of, a, of a, an institution like Te Ako Whaiora. Applying that to the climate issue, uh, do I think that an independent statutory entity at arm's length from government that holds government to account uh, on climate sustainability might be the best structure? I'm not sure. Um, yeah. Thanks, Corbin. I mean, arguably we have one of those in the Climate Change Commission. <laughs> so, so there are, there are um, interesting recent developments in terms of how well they are being listened to or not, so um, so we have some some answer there. Right, I'm going to jump into some of these questions, and and hopefully you will have seen. Uh, I've been kind of trying to weave a few of these themes in, but there's some there's some really good ones, and I've lost it now. Um, in terms of um, some questions here, um, and some quick fire ones, Jill, you've been fantastic. Um, I'm just going to move quickly through. So, agree or disagree? This is like a hot hot quick one. Aotearoa is getting better in the way that it treats migrant or minority minority communi uh, communities. Agree or disagree? Disagree. <laughs> Aotearoa is getting better in the way it treats its um, communities. I've lost it now. The, its communities. Um, I think we, um, the migrant communities. I totally disagree. Disagree. Corbin? Uh, disagree. Disagree. That's not even a disagree, agree kind of question. Yeah. But of course I disagree. Yeah. yeah. Johnny? Yeah. Disagree. Yeah. And, and and the reason I point on that, and, and it kind of was a pre, you know, a, a fairly loaded question, but to bring us back to Johnny when you were talking about migration, and we have challenges right now in terms of acknowledging or reflecting the voices of the people here now, we know that there, and David, you shared this really interesting graphic on LinkedIn with human climate niches and just highlighted where where people are or are not going to be able to live. And Aotearoa New Zealand was a nice green spot that is going to be the very um, welcoming or welcoming. It's going to be a very appealing place to be. So if we're already not very good and we're not really making any progress, how is that going to look as we have increasingly diverse communities? Um, quick question. So where do you encounter the biggest resistance for an equitable and just transition? Thoughts? Where? Where do you encounter the biggest resistance for an equitable and just transition? It's a difficult one. The, my answer probably reflects the kinds of spaces that I move in, but um, I think everybody rhetorically agrees with the idea of a just and 
in, in, in equitable transition. I mean, it's hard to disagree with, really. I think everybody, mostly, apart from perhaps eco-fascist tourist, terrorists, um, <laughs> you know, um, most people will, will be on board with that. It, it, it's the, pro the challenge is implementing it and, um, you know, having to make the recommitments of funding, the you know, redesign of policy and so on. Um, I think I touched on the fact that, you know, a lot of our policy, especially at the central government level, is, is um, you know, uses economic instruments like the emissions trading scheme, which are inherently um, inequitable in the way that they put price signals on households and, um, you know, they tend to have a regressive effect where low-income households which spend, um, you know, more money on things like fuel for cars as a proportion of their household spending, they carry more of that. And so, you know, unless policymakers are really going in and redesigning these things in order to neutralise or to counter those effects, then, you know, all of these... Um, all, all of this hand waving around just and equitable transitions, it just, um, it's kind of like a form of, of, of gaslighting. Um, there needs to be like much more robust commitments around um, how policy is done to, to really um, turn that into a reality. Any other thoughts on that? We, uh, <laughs> we <laughs> No, um, maybe if we frame it another way, and this just leads into one of the other questions. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, we've heard one of those barriers is very much community's ability to to move out of that survival mode. So, if we want to take that and maybe um, you know thinking about those those um, challenging conversations you're talking about or your other role, you know, how can we enable those communities to move out of that survival mode so that they can be part of that just transition? Uh, I think there's two sort of opportunities. One, which we don't really do well, is, is you know, we tend to look at our current state and look to the future options in the way of navigating or transforming. So we're very future orientated, but in a real linear way. Um, we're not looking to the wisdom of our past. So when we think about the state of many of our whānau in a state of survival, th there was a time in our history when we were thriving. You know, so so, but we've lost sight of that, and and so often it's more that circular return to that state of thriving, and I think too that many of our Fano, our communities, that while they're in survival mode, they're still resilient because they're still here. You know that that there's some real obvious sort of observations, um, and and I think that the real opportunity sits in. Um, how do we change the conditions around the whānau? Because it's not about trying to get the whānau to change, it's the conditions around them. You know, and often um, it's a strategy too that, that instead of, um, you know, trying to have that conversation on how you're going to change, it's actually about changing the conditions around people and communities. So some of the work that's happening right now within the Pūnui it's anchored in place, so it's a real place anchored approach. And we've adopted a catchment approach because it could have been either a steam restoration project or a community development project. And we and, and either focuses on one element, not a holistic focus around oranga or wellbeing. And and so the real sort of outcome and th this is a fifty year sort of project, you know. That could be what, three or four generations within the Māori whānau? Um, and and so um, so catchment locating to catchment brings and identifies a number of communities. And one of those things we're discovering within the Pūnu is that we can work over three generations. And some of the cool things that are happening is our upper catchment is where our, our more um, affluent people live that tend to also be part of the friends of the Pūnui and those sort of care groups, which are really awesome. But what we're seeing is a lot of our elderly people out on a mission taking care of things, and if we can link them to our young people, 
we're starting to see three generations starting to come together because how do we tap into the wisdom of our old people alongside that excitement and exuberance of our young people? And, and this is something that when um, our young people are getting into the climate strikes and that, um, and, and we're doing our te taruki tafari work at the time, when we sat down with our young people, they said, oh, what was missing from their view was the elders. And so being able to anchor them with the elders where, um, you know, because our kids, eh, they're the ones that are leading the way anyway, but the guidance and the wisdom that come from our elders. So being able to think about at least over three generations. Um, I'm really lucky I live in a four-generational home. I've got Mokopuna, my mum, who's 83. So challenging conversations that need to happen in our house um, because of those different generations. And, and But at the end of the day, it's that focus on the well-being of our whānau and the roles that we can play um, together. And it's, it's those sort of approaches, I guess, in, in um, how do we anchor the place. Catchments create a really good natural flow in terms of how communities that come together. And I know that um, the, the, the importance of being able to anchor to place is part of that solution because um, what's good for the Pua Nui may not be the same sort of thing. So, And I guess the other insight that we learned from COVID was a different um, understanding of scale and scaling. So often we're looking for solutions that we can take the scale, was what we learned in COVID was the importance of our little bubbles, our little safety bubbles like scales on the fish, and how those little bubbles can come together and connect and support in you know, more smaller sort of economies and those sort of things. It's, it's in some ways going old school in terms of how this country was and, and learning from those experiences to how do we apply it within the 21st century um, as our communities continue to diversify. Um, and I guess the last point on this um, is I really know when we made it, when all our communities can engage in institutions using their 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 own language. That's the real to me the 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 where where we've arrived in the place because we sort of talk about New Zealand being multicultural. If you ask any of our whānau, can they engage in an institution using their language? We will have to conform to English or common language, and that's part of the issue around the system around the the lack of agility of these institutions that really connect to our communities, you know? And that's that's the real challenge um, going forward. Yeah. I, um, I think that's great. And and um, one one thing to know, I think, um, this, this question of perspective, and I think your four-generational household is really interesting from a you get to know what each other's perspectives are, quite, quite as you said, challenging conversations, but really important to get that perspective. Um, it, it, there is a, another great question which kind of leads to that, which is, um, how do we move from tinkering with the edges of the system to chucking out the system founded on, um, it says here, white supremacy, patriarchy, capitalism, I'd add colonialism to that. I don't think we're going to be able to cover that in the next uh, 10 minutes, but but it, it, it hits that point about systems and structures that you talked about, you know, helping families or communities out. We need to recognise that system that sits around it. Um, there is a question, though, and you mentioned COVID, and I'd be really interested um, from all your perspectives. So there's a comment here, and we... We have a broad view that the communication around COVID was good and successful. Do we think it was successful? And if it was, what can we learn from that climate response that we can help galvanise action at a broad scale? And the reason I say do we think it was successful is, was it successful for everyone? I think it was successful in the sense that it achieved behaviour change because you saw people who were disengaged from community, you know, very hard to get to communities, being engaged, um, being connected to and, you know, part of the whole um, COVID response. Uh, whereas, yeah, we're, yeah, so I think... What was your question again? Or was it successful? Yeah, that's why I think it was successful, because it achieved that behaviour change. 
and it got into communities where uh, people find very hard to connect, agencies traditionally find hard to engage with. I think it was also successful because it got the message through to people that it's going to affect you directly and your whānau and your future and your life and it's urgent. So I think it was, is, it was successful in that respect. And I think there's lessons for climate action because people don't see it as an urgent, uh, you know, um, issue for some. They're not connecting the flooding and the walkway that's on the coastal, you know, edge falling into the ocean and the rain and all that. They're not connecting that with climate action, I don't think. Um, and so they're not, yeah, they're not, they're not engaging in this. And I think that the challenge is how do we show people that this is affecting your daily life directly? Um, because, yeah, just people just aren't seeing the relevance. Yeah. And, and I think that uh, in, importantly as well is how do we do that without, and, and rely, relying is a terrible way of thinking about it, but, but obviously the, the extreme weather events that we saw and there was some polling done and post that there was a, a, an increase in like awareness and urgency around it, but obviously we don't want to just rely on significant storm events and, and people suffering as a result of that. So there's a question of how do we escalate that urgency without just relying on the impacts of climate change, which arguably is too late. But. Um, so, so we're just rounding it out, and um, and I, and I have one last question for for the for the for the for the for the crew. Um, before I do that, thank you everyone for for providing your comments. There are some great ones here, and and Pock, I think you must be online. I can't see you in the room. Um, Pock always has a great way. Oh no, he's there. Oh, he's running away. He's running away. There's a great there's a great way. He has a great way with words, and and one of the comments I just want to turn it into a comment is within the word emergency is to emerge. And so how do, we, how do we help our communities emerge out of their current state, which is a really lovely way of, of, of framing it. So thanks, Poc. Um, but my last question. So we started this evening with the rating five, you know, zero to, zero to 10 of how, how, how our climate response is going generally, but obviously trying to feed that um, inequity comment in there or con con uh, context in there. So quickly, <laughs> if, as quick as we can, like, what would take what would it take to get to a 10 what do you think we need to do to get from where we were which was middling which i think was an optimistic view to a to a 10 any any way to get to 10 would involve a lot of different things so <laughs> i'll just focus on one thing though because it speaks to some of what we've talk, been talking about especially in regards to institutional stuckness and, and that system inertia. I think, I think one opportunity is, is using intermediaries, organizations or groups which don't quite belong to the big public or private bureaucracies which struggle to turn quick, but can kind of work between them and create partnerships which enable them to support change and some of the sorts of activities that they're unable to do themselves. And I think a really interesting example, actually, from the health sector is Fano Order, um, as you know, working between Fano and and some of those government agencies to just ease that, ease the activity and to help guide and um, improve outcomes. You know, we've been involved in the Aotearoa Circle, which does a bit of that more in the climate and environmental space. I also think of Araake, the Energy Innovation Centre. You know, these sorts of entities, and they can just sit between the big. Um, leviathans of, of public and private sector and, and to help, you know, create that space for them to innovate and to try new different things. Um, I think for me, speaking from a Pacifica perspective, it's more of like giving space, um, allowing us Pacifica people to, you know, to, um, to be heard and to give um, our input into the climate change talanoa. Yeah. Securing adaptation and mitigation as a nonpartisan issue. How do you do that? <laughs> well, there's a lot involved, so I'll leave it's it there. 
Um, I think to get to a 10, it is uh, definitely it's community led, but everybody on the same page as to what the goal is and everybody understanding what the goal is. Um, because I think we can talk about, you know, the big picture, we can talk about what we're trying to achieve, but we lose people in the implementation. So if we all understand what we're trying to do, um, then people will take some ownership and they will understand why their daily life is being disrupted by these cones that are blocking the road um, to put in a cycleway or to put in a bus lane or to put in um, proper curbing so people can walk places. I think that will really, really help bring um, my rating up to a 10 and um, the yeah implementation, the community-led, pardon? Yeah, I also said for I'm, I want I want that ten, but also people knowing that what they're doing makes a difference, and people feeling that what they're doing makes a difference in the big picture of things, because a lot of the time you know you're like, okay, I'm being inconvenienced because I'm going to catch a bus, uh, I catch caught the bus here, going to catch the bus home, and I want to know that my getting out of my car is contributing to um, climate action and making a difference for. Um, what we're trying to achieve, and I think people need to know that, and they'll hopefully um, buy into it. Buy into it. Yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm really hopeful, and I think that's a real important thing that we need to acknowledge is about how, how do we reinvigorate a sense of hope amongst our people, amongst our communities, because we've been quite hammered through COVID and a whole lot of things. Um, and hope's really important. Um, my goal would be sort of aiming to get to a 15, uh, only because I'm an optimist and I believe. Um, and I think too, this is really part of understanding our history and past. So, you know, David mentioned, you know, since the Industrial Revolution, the Agricultural Revolution prior. So those are just fa phases of time. And, and so what, we're in a five or 600 year Industrial Revolution what, what we're sort of witnessing is the fraying of the edge of the square and because the current square system's under immense pressure. And what's been revealed on the frailed edge of the square is nature. Um, and the reality is either she's going to get rid of us because we're no longer useful for her, you know, that's part of our reality. It's not us trying to save the world, it's the world really saving us if we shift um, and I guess the, I don't know whether this is controversial, but um, we had a little glimpse, you know, through COVID and, and post-cycling Gabriel, what a Māori-led, Pacifica-led response looks like. And there was hope that that could be the normal. Um, if we were able to have a Māori-Pacifica-led response anchored around wellbeing, we'll get to a 15. That, that's the, the, you know... That, that's really the, a hopeful message because from a Māori perspective, we've had almost 200 years of the current system. You know, an opportunity is hand the steering paddle over to Māori, to tangata whenua, and we'll steer our course for the benefit of everyone. And I think there's still that little bit of fear around what am I letting go of power in order for someone else, you know, this whole what we've seen in the, in, in the political debates at the moment but we haven't given a go, you know, and, and that's what makes me hopeful in the next 200 years of our, because we're a real young nation. We're, we're like still at kohanga <laughs> you know, we're still at kindergarten, we're still learning to get to know each other as uh, people, peoples, you know, and so, um, but certainly when we think about the impact of the square system of all of us as humans, we become disconnected and displaced from place that sense of home, and I think that's the hopeful element of we're all trying to find home or, or return to source, you know, and, and certainly indigenous wisdom can play a key role in being able to sort of heal ourselves as well as we heal, heal each other in that sense, you know. Um, we saw the hope of that within COVID for a little time. Um, then, then all the different voices started to, the, the me's started to get in the way as opposed to the we's. Um, and I guess the other key learning thing in that 
Um, we saw the vaccination rates jump up within Māori and Pacifica when they shifted from agency-led to community-led. And what that's about is trust. Who, who do our families trust? And that's the critical thing. If we can really look at who, who, who's going to help navigate us, those in between, the in between us, between big institutions, because I see them as navigators. They're the ones that navigate and influence space, and certainly trust is at the heart of that. Because I think we'll start to see that shift across our communities when we really see those that are coming to help navigate and support uh, the people that we trust in our local communities and those sort of things. So, so trust is a critical element. Kia ora, Johnny. I think that's a fabulous place to, to wrap up this evening's um, quarter. Or uh, Before I um, invite Councillor Dalton to come up and say a final vote of thanks, um, two things just to throw out there. One, um, there was a question, do we have a formal Auckland Council's climate action plan? We do. It is Te Tārake Tafali. so if you don't know about it, go to climateakl .co.nz and check it out. Um, some of the things that Johnny spoke about are, are woven in there. Um, how well we've delivered on it is a, is a different question, a different question, different answer, but, but there is the foundation point there. The, the second thing, just a bit of a, um, as, as I said right at the start, this has been week one of four around climate action activities, climate action events, so please go check out some more um, uh, AucklandClimateFestival.co.nz and really engage open your minds, think more broadly about what this response looks like, consider a lot of what we've discussed here about um, your views, your perspectives, and how we open it up to a brighter, broader range of voices and perspectives. So with that, I'd like to express my personal thanks for, 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 for the guys here. It has been superb to have, have got you all together. I've really enjoyed the conversation, and I really appreciate you all taking the time out to be part of this, and to Jill as well online, and thank you for, for jumping in and, and providing your thoughts. So round of applause, and I'd invite Councillor Dalton to come up and say a few words.